Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. It's Tuesday, September 6, 1.30. Uh, I'm the chair, Zach Bell. I'd like to uh, welcome our members, Lynn Lund, Trish Altas, Gord McNeely. We have visiting today, Michelle Beaton. Um, so we have a, a very busy day today with some uh, very important topics. Uh, we're going to be hearing uh, about the population action plan as well as current labor shortages. So we have some special guests. I'll get you to introduce yourselves uh, for Hansert, and then we'll turn things over to you uh, for the two topics. We'll start with uh, you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, <clears throat> I have a few words to say if you want to start that way or just do introductions. Do introductions and then you can say a few words there if that's all right. All right. Uh, I'm Lois Thompson, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Hi, I'm Cal Whitnell, Director of Economic and Population Growth, a division within Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Hunter. I'm the Director of Workforce Development. And just before we start there, Minister, I'll actually ask for an adoption of the agenda. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so, Minister, you uh, had a little brief introduction. Yeah, I do. <clears throat> I'll be, in a, and it will be brief, of course. Uh, this is my f new at this role is Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture, and it's only been uh, not quite two months yet, so uh, we're still lots to learn, and uh, we're we're diving right into it. So, however, however. Uh, I, I do know that our population growing is growing and we're finding labor is becoming a, a ch challenge for employers. So our island's population growth was a goal that was originally set by the previous administration and uh, when they launched the Population Action Plan in 2017. This plan was to grow and diversify the island's population by 2022. In many ways, the action plan achieved uh, nine goals it set out to do. However, we do know that other issues that follow when we increase our population. Today's presentation is an opportunity to review the previous plan to identify what was a success and the areas that need to be reconsidered as we work towards creating the new population uh, strategy for 2023 and beyond. So. Okay. Thank you, Minister. So just so the members are aware, we're going to have both presentations. I believe Mary's going to start with the labor shortages, followed by Cal talking about the uh, population action plan. So if it's all right, we're going to turn things over to you, Mary, and you can begin with your presentation. Sorry, Chair, uh, we're going to do both. Can we ask questions after the first one? The presenters asked because they said there will be some tie-in between the two presentations if they could present both topics, and then we'll have questions coming on the end. Thank you. Perfect. Mary? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the invitation today to a uh, standing committee to talk about labour shortages in Prince Edward Island. So the outline of my presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about the labour market uh, context and some of the terminology that we often hear when, when we're talking about labour market shortages. Our labour market indicators in PEI, what our current initiatives are that we're focusing on and what our future focus looks like going into 2023. So really when we talk about labour market context, it's important that we understand the terminology and both Cal and I are members of the form of labour market ministers as bureaucrats where we're, we're always looking at terminology and we're trying to agree to certain terms because they are used somewhat interchangeably when we're talking about workforce. So the slide really talks about labour shortages, skills shortages and skills mismatches. Labour shortages do refer to the lack of candidates for a specific job in a specific labour market. So where we may have a labour shortage in one occupation, a nearby community or province may uh, define it differently because of their geographic requirements. Skills shortages refer to a lack of candidates with the required skills. So you will hear that sometimes people have people that respond to applications, they're not screened in for interviews because they do not have the, the skill required to fill that vacant position. And then skills mismatch, which is becoming more common in our province when employers are adjusting, maybe it's their product line or there's new technology, and the, the digitization of some of the skills is changing what the requirements are and the current employee doesn't have those, that skill set to be able to meet that job. These definitions have been adopted by the Labour Market Information Council and have been agreed to across the country, um, defined as what's in a name. 
So the labor shortage does occur, as I had noted, with a lack of candidates for a particular job specific to an occupational category and a geographic region. A skills shortage occurs when there's a sufficient number of candidates applying for a position. However, their specific skill set does not meet the needs of that position. And a skills mismatch refers to the situation in which an employee's current skills do not match the, the, uh, those skills needed to perform the current job. Measuring our labor shortages, I'm sure everyone's watching the Atlantic um, Provinces Economic Council. We've been participating in a number of studies with the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council and what they always um, encourage workforce development staff is to not just look at one single metrics when you're trying to identify solutions on labor shortages. Um, you know, quite often we're looking at what training programs do we fund, how does that relate to our data, what do we know on the shortages, how does the temporary foreign worker program impact our labor shortages. We look at opportunities and demand for immigration programs and implement other labor market initiatives. So our indicators, uh, you know, we've been monitoring very closely pre-pandemic levels in the workforce and the impact that the pandemic has had on the workforce. Our employment levels in July of this year reached 84,900, so we've now surpassed our pre-COVID levels. That percentage isn't balanced for all demographics, and we're going to talk a little bit about that through the presentation. Our unemployment rate was 5.7%. Our June unemployment rate hit 4.9%, which was the lowest since 1976 in our province. We, in 2022, July, we had 5,100 people who were unemployed. Our vacancies reported by employers was just over 5,400 people, resulting in a vacancy rate of 7.8% in PEI. So employment across age groups, it may be a little hard to see on your screens, but where the line is, it's shadowed at the end. We were measuring the pandemic from February 2020 until current times to track the adjustments that were happening in the different um, age demographics. So the orange line at the top is our 25 to 54 year year um, cohort, which is considered our core age working population. And you can see where we are today at the, just over the 51,000 people has been the highest dating back since uh, the early 2000s. So that group has recovered from the pandemic. You'll see the, the graying line is our mature worker demographic and the blue line represents our youth. So each month we're tracking out the data to see you know, where we are with the different age cohorts in economic recovery. We do know we're experiencing a labor market tightness that we've never experienced in our province before, thus the help wanted ads where I think you can pretty well see on every, every door uh, looking for labor. So according to Statistics Canada data, in January 2022, there were 4.3 unemployed people persons for every vacancy that we had. In June, that reduced to 0.95, so less than a person available for every vacancy that we had in our province, which really made us leading the country on our, our vacancy um, tightness that we were experiencing in the province. So what about the skill shortages? This is um, you know, the topic that we get into. We, we do have responsibility for work PEI, where we track out vacancies that are getting posted by employers, how many responses they have. And this is where we are really starting to see that um, the number of applications coming can still sometimes be high for positions. The blue bar demonstrates the vacancies, and the orange bar starts to demonstrate how many applications are coming in. So we're hearing more and more from some employers who are unable to fill positions because they don't have the appropriate skill set, the individual applying doesn't have the appropriate skill set to fill that need, so the vacancy remains unfilled. This activity suggests that there's a skill shortage as well as some mismatch going on within our workforce. Occupations currently in demand, so again referring to the Labour Market Information Council because this can be, you know, when you're looking at workforce data, we try to align across the country with how we define and how we measure. So this is looking at occupations that had the highest number of vacancies posted in our province from January 2021 until June 2022. Retail sales 
cooks, light duty cleaners, no surprise registered nurses, retail wholesale trade managers, material handlers, transport and truck drivers, which is really important to moving goods in our province, cashiers, delivery courier service drivers, admin assistant, early childhood educators and assistants, construction trade helpers, laborers, carpenters. We are very similar in Atlantic Canada to our occupations that have the highest vacancies, which tells us while we're similar, we're also competitors for skill sets um, for those positions. What are some of the, our additional labor market indicators? I really do feel that the data can tell you one thing, but certainly speaking to our stakeholders, our partners, our industry groups, bring a wealth of information and knowledge to us to help us try to figure out how to shape the programs that we administer. So we do collect data through our labor market transfer agreements with the federal government. We do uh, planning with our industry associations, sector councils, and organizations representing underrepresented groups. Last fiscal, we had over 100 meetings with those set organizations to be able to set what our funding initiatives would be for this coming year. And we have ongoing partnerships. I, I mentioned one with the Labor Market Information Council, but certainly APEC and other groups to help us inform our uh, labor market indicators. So current labor market initiatives, uh, you know, you'll see, I, I know you're aware that we're putting a, an emphasis on health care priorities programs. So last year we expanded eligibility for Islanders who could participate in health care programs. Uh, this year we've added some additional classes. Uh, Summerside's now running a licensed practical nurse program. We've expanded the resident care worker program. We're in negotiations with two other communities to administer programs. Uh, we have been very um, transparent with what that needs to look like because we need to ensure that there is, you know, we want to see 14 graduates come out of those programs. So sometimes, you know, if we're to administer a program with five or six people, um, you know, it's not the best method for administering programs. So we've set some parameters on what it needs to look like in each community, and that's been going really well across the province. Uh, trades programming has been big with us, in particular both youth and newcomers, new trades programs to really get at the underrepresented populations to try to increase skills. Early childhood training, we've been doing this work over the past three to four years with the Department of Education where we're taking, um, we're participating for early childhood educators that don't have a certificate or a license where they can continue to work and complete the training requirements to get to the certification levels. That's a tough balance, and I think we've, we've had two or three different models of blended, um, blended delivery to try to meet the needs of people that are working full-time and training, because it's not an easy task for sure. Our industry-focused um, training certainly has increased the last couple of years. The bioscience sector with their CASEL program were the primary funder for that initiative with the Tourism Industry Association and the Restaurants Association. For the past two years, we've been running the Cook Training Program and numerous other regional and industry-based human resource support projects. Specific population groups, these, this is a list of just some of the initiatives that we have been running. I think the element for us is that, that consultation that we do with industry and groups is extremely important. Um, they define what the challenge is and we try to brainstorm with them to create opportunities to address that challenge. It's an important step for us. We're not going in and launching programs that we think will work based on what's worked in other jurisdictions or you know, across the country. It's based on what industry is telling us should be the requirements and doing a consultation on that on, okay, is this going to impact all of our, our population groups that we're trying to serve? So our future focus, um, labor market is now supply driven. We need to invest in islanders and we need to invest in the skills of islanders. Where you look at the trends of workforce 10 years ago, I would have been probably sitting in this seat suggesting that uh, it's a demand-driven market and we need to accommodate our employers to sustain economic growth. Where my position now is we have to invest in our people to ensure that they can succeed in the labor force of, of tomorrow. So we're going to continue analyzing labor market data and, and monitoring our program indicators, but we're going to consult and try to be as nimble and responsive as we can. Um, 
you know, immigration remains a key pillar for us with the labor shortages in order to ensure that positions are filled. We don't see going forward without in, uh, continuing to have immigration as one of those key pillars. Our program development and delivery needs to be flexible and responsive, and I, I think, you know, that um, the one thing that the pandemic did shine a light on is you need to be nimble and you need to be able to change gears quickly. And, um, you know, suffice it to say, over the past couple of years, I think our teams have been able to to deliver on that. And maintaining and growing partnerships. This isn't a government division or department thinking we know what's best for workforce. We're often asked to pull data for certain sectors and come together with their um, membership in order to talk about some of the challenges that they face. So our priorities, we're developing a workforce strategy plan. The element that's taking us more time is this needs to complement all of the other economic and social plans that exist. It needs to take into consideration poverty reduction strategy. It needs to take into consideration housing. It needs to take into consideration economic indicators and population growth. We are in, uh, we're just starting negotiations with the federal government, so um, the divisional budget for me is just around 34 million. 95% of that is a transfer through the federal government, and we're starting negotiations on those agreements that are up for renewal in 2023. For that, we are continuously saying we need the flexibility. We don't want to be locked into program streams for a five-year term. We would like to have some ability to be nimble and responsive. We're trying to modernize our labor market services. Um, you know, I'm the first one to say we were very paper-based. Clients were coming to us to administer and to seek funding, and the pandemic kind of turned that on its head with, uh, you know, we need to be able to respond, we need to be able to upgrade our programs and services to be digital. Keeping in mind that, you know, our clients are our center focus. If we don't have Islanders seeking service, then we don't have a delivery model for, for um, our unit. So I'm going to switch it over to Cal. And just before Cal, yes. I'm just going to take a very short recess just to give them uh, time in the uh, room there to get the new slide set up. So we're just going to take a very, very short recess. Thanks for that uh, brief little uh, a little recess. So we're going to turn things over now for you, for Cal, for the uh, population uh, strategy or action plan. Very good. You can take her over. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me today and uh, having the opportunity to come and speak about the current population action plan and the next steps as well towards a uh, new population strategy. Uh, the current population action plan, which uh, was launched in 2017, was a five-year plan. Uh, obviously, we're coming to the end of that plan uh, at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. There were nine goals and 39 action items uh, included within that plan. I'll get a little bit into uh, some of the results from that uh, based on what some of those priorities were uh, and some of those action items which are uh, cross-cutting um, um, across government in terms of a lot of those action items. Some of the key dashboard targets are those nine goals, uh, focus on population, obviously, uh, the workforce, um, immigration targets, um, and uh, economic uh, metrics as well around GDP. Uh, 
Um, the 39 action items, which I'll get into a little bit, um, various items are met or partially met, um, but a lot of those action items are not one and done in nature. They're, uh, a lot of things have been done, but those, a lot of those will continue on uh, ongoing as well. So in terms of uh, some of the feedback we did uh, over the last few years, um, have continued conversation across government. Uh, we do have a, a committee that uh, supports this work across government. Uh, we've also gone out to our external partners for feedback, uh, various partners that we do fund, uh, to try to get their understanding uh, as well, or, or input as well, and insights in terms of what they're seeing around uh, what does population growth mean and what does that mean in terms of their lens and, and some of those uh, considerations that we have to take into account. Um, a few key themes that came out were the value of immigration. Uh, I think that's an important uh, factor, obviously, and uh, I know Mary touched on that in terms of um, the intake and, and that supply, and that's something that we're going to be definitely uh, focused on as well from that perspective. A big part, uh, as we transition, uh, a lot of individuals are coming in with permanent residency. Now they uh, a lot more are coming in with uh, temporary residence. So it's, a fi it's making sure how the province can make those adjustments and, and uh, tangible um, uh, supports for those individuals as well. The importance of rural, uh, as you can imagine, we are seeing a lot more diversity um, uh, through the province and across the province, which is great. Uh, internet has come up, uh, something that's being worked on. I'll get into that a little bit further. The idea around community capacity uh, and collaboration, which I think is critical, and, and there's been a lot more uh, different groups, different funding streams to support that work as well. Uh, the impact of COVID, obviously the ground has been shifting over the last few years, and I think that's something that's going to help provide some insights and, and a pathway in terms of maybe some other considerations that we have to take a look at that maybe we didn't have to in the past. Uh, housing and transportation focus uh, obviously comes up a lot. Um, We'll touch on that a little bit. Um, one of the key themes from some of our cross-government partners and our uh, external feedback was around the action plans themselves, uh, action items, and how it's kind of working in a silo versus uh, co fully coordinated and connected. And I'll get into that, and I think that's going to be a critical uh, element of the new population strategy that's going to be launched uh, later this year, early next year. Uh, and then the importance of feedback, or, or excuse me, of workforce, and I think that's something that Mary's already touched on in collaboration with industry, and, and there's a lot of supports and a lot of efforts going on uh, within our department, um, with, within uh, Mary's shop as well. So I think those are some of the key in, insights that uh, we, we've heard and which will definitely inform a new population strategy moving forward. In terms of the population dashboard itself, uh, obviously the overall number one priority or, or target that was put in place was to grow the population of PI to 160,000 over the first five years. Uh, that was definitely surpassed uh, early on. Uh, we're approaching or above 167,000 now in terms of uh, the most recent uh, estimates that came out. Uh, so that's something that was definitely exceeded. Um, and, and with that, obviously, there some, comes some additional considerations, additional supports that we have to look at, et cetera. Uh, working age population, uh, that's obviously was surpassed as well in, t in 2019. Uh, the goal was to have a working age population, those age 15 to 64, um, by the end of 2022, and that, that has been surpassed uh, in 2019. Um, a few of the other key indicators here, uh, inter interprovincial migration, uh, that does fluctuate, but on average, uh, we were seeing a net gain of, of greater than 100 per year. International immigration, I think that's obviously a key focus of uh, the population, one of the key levers as well in terms of both from an economic perspective but also, also as important as the social and, and cultural um, considerations as well. Uh, the, the view was looking at PI about 2,200 per year. We're around the 2,200 to 2,500 per year uh, New Islanders uh, and, and that has been continuing. Um, the immigration retention rate, there was uh, not specific metrics around that. Um, obviously, we've seen those uh, retention rates increase uh, over time um, from as far back as 10 years ago to what we're seeing now. Obviously, those rates have increased. And there's been some recent reports that have come out, both uh, StatsCan data, but also IRCC uh, uh, data stats as well that has come out. 
Um, retention of international students. We are seeing more international students into the province um, with, with the view of trying to get to 10% was the original metric. Uh, that can be difficult to uh, measure, but it's something that I uh, feel is being achieved at this point in time. Uh, business startups, um, there's continued work with both within the uh, department as well with Innovation PEI and, and broad, more broadly across government as well uh, in looking at this space. And then from an economic perspective, uh, GDP per capita, so gross domestic product, uh, PEI uh, since 2007 from a GDP perspective, uh, obviously pre-COVID, uh, we're the only jurisdiction in Canada that had continuous positive economic growth uh, until until COVID. So we're doing some good things there. From a GDP per capita, it did fluctuate, um, so we weren't uh, necessarily always at the Canadian uh, average, um, but it's something that, from an economic perspective, uh, population growth and economic growth are, are highly correlated and something that have both been on uh, positive trends. In terms of the action plan itself, it is broken down into uh, different segments and diff different action items, uh, recruitment, uh, retain, retain and retention, uh, repatriation and rural. And I'll get into a little bit uh, of the themes around this. Obviously, there's a critical uh, theme around immigration, uh, action item one there, targeted immigration, um, the PMP uh, review that was done. So there has, those are being met and they're both ongoing. Obviously, there's been a lot of work in those two areas. Um, immigration con continues to be a, a major focus. Uh, there are new uh, PMP has been adjusted around those workforce streams, which has been very valuable for, for um, employers and, and companies in terms of filling uh, some of those um, uh, gaps. Province-wide settlement supports, we've continued to expand our supports with our existing uh, partners. Uh, we both have uh, URSA Immigrant Refugee Service Association. We have uh, CBDC Navigators, um, and we've continued to expand as well in terms of new partners, in terms of navigation services with BIPOC Usher. Um, and we've also uh, looked at a new program that's launched today as well in terms of uh, gender equity, diversity, inclusivity, and community enhancement fund. And I'll get in a, in a little bit of that uh, information, a little bit more details on that as well. But from the province-wide settlement supports, it's something that we continue to focus on and, and the importance of that. And, and that goes without saying that those two organizations that I mentioned in terms of the navigators, in terms of URSA PEI, have uh, been instrumental in terms of the Ukrainian efforts as well, in terms of individuals uh, coming to PEI. Um, we continue, continue down through the various uh, elements here in terms of retaining uh, graduates uh, and, and uh, those uh, international students as well. We have supports in place both through uh, Study and Stay, through um, uh, Atlantic Student Development Alliance and, and other work that uh, other divisions, uh, other departments are doing with uh, international students as well. We have the Welcome to Community Initiatives, which we are seeing expansion on that. Obviously, we have seen diversity um, uh, events. We've seen Neighbor to Neighbor through CBDC Navigator, which one is coming up, uh, I believe it's an October time frame. Um, so continue working in this space, uh, work PI, which Mary mentioned earlier as well, continue to work on that and trying to make sure that the, those, uh, the matching of, with employers and, and uh, skilled workers is, is uh, there's, there's an avenue and a pathway to do so. In terms of some other action items, in terms of uh, retain or retention, um, there's a graduate incentive program and then the graduate mentorship program, which was launched, um, which helps uh, students after uh, post-grad. Um, and, and also uh, there was a new stream as well for uh, international students uh, on an annual basis. I believe it's in the 40 to 50 range on an annual basis. Um, so you'll see some additional uh, supports there that were put in place, uh, human resource supports um, as well. There's an HR momentum program that's being funded uh, both through, I believe, Workforce Skills PEI, uh, Innovation PEI, and I believe CO as well in terms of helping, making sure that those uh, small, smaller medium-sized businesses have that capacity and productivity from an HR supports perspective. Inclusive growth, uh, something that our division is uh, uh, definitely would have a responsibility for, is working with those organizations from a diversity, inclusivity perspective. Uh, and I mentioned, obviously, we BIPOC usher, we have Black Culture Society and many more that uh, we're working on, uh, working with as well in terms of that space. Uh, repatriate. Uh, there's some other action items uh, here as well, and I won't get into all the details on, on these, but there's been a number of that uh, have either been partially met or, or for future consideration. 
some were uh, up and running prior to COVID, i.e. the PEI success and, and launching some of these through social marketing, social media, some of the success stories of individuals moving here. Something through COVID that, uh, something that ended, but uh, something that we definitely want to consider making sure that we do look at those testimonies and, and success stories in terms of uh, those individuals coming to PEI. And finally, the uh, fourth pillar around rural, and you'll see a, a list of about 11 action items here as well. Um, a lot of work with rural development here as well. There's the economic advisory councils, which were established, which is now one uh, advisory council across the province. Um, there's the labor matching components, um, uh, rural high speed internet access. Obviously, there's been some major investments in that space uh, with, with some major projects, and then also a lot of other funding. Um, and new funding that's been introduced to uh, look at those that final, I, I guess the final uh, gaps that needs, need to be closed, making sure uh, the citizens and residents and, and uh, businesses have that access that they need, uh, um, both in the uh, urban and the rural areas. Um, talk, touched on already the welcome communities, um, province-wide <laughs> settlement support. So there is some overlap between some of these action items, and I think that's an area that we're going to need to focus on in the new strategy as well to make sure that there's that connectedness and one clear uh, strategic approach. Just in terms of getting into the population projections, a um, few different sources that we use, and, and we are going to be going out, and I'll get into it a little bit further. In terms of new population forecast and, and a bit of a planning tool that we're planning to, uh, or we will be uh, going to RFP. Uh, the PI Stats Bureau, so the Economic Stats Group uh, in Finance, uh, they have produced uh, projections. Just wanted to put this slide up here just to give you a sense of kind of where we're trending. Obviously, at 2022, we're seeing about 167,000 plus in terms of population currently. Uh, within the next 13 years or so, uh, we're likely to surpass that 200,000. So that's another 33 to 35,000 um, uh, individuals uh, living here in the province. And obviously that comes with a number of considerations, both from a social, uh, cultural, but also an economic and uh, infrastructure and services. So there's a lot of considerations around what that might mean for the province and that we'll have to embed and consider within the new strategy. Uh, StatsCan has uh, recently launched additional um, kind of baseline or, or alternative scenarios for uh, projection, uh, uh, population projections for each jurisdiction across Canada. I won't get into all the uh, different scenarios that they've run, but just to give you a sense, kind of their high-low uh, in 2043, so about a 20-year uh, horizon. They're looking at around 185,000 to about 230 to 235,000. So the estimates that the province has put together in those projections is similarly aligned, likely more along uh, uh, kind of middle ground in terms of the estimates that you're seeing from a, from the federal side. Maybe maybe the provincial is a little bit higher, um, but these were based on just to get a sense of where where we see population going, and these will definitely help us in terms of understanding uh, in terms of that planning uh, cycle, and I think that's going to be a key piece moving forward. So what we're hearing, um, we work, as I said, with various partners. Uh, we do partner feedback. We have done surveying. Um, uh, URSA PEI has put, puts out uh, quite regularly to uh, newcomers surveys, which we uh, had a lot of good information throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, we also had uh, worked, partnered with Island Studies faculty on a survey that went out. It was really around trying to understand uh, a bit more around the sense of belonging on PEI, uh, why people are leaving, why people are staying PEI. So we have some uh, preliminary results from that, um, and we will be having a final report uh, provided to us very shortly from those findings. Um, there was approximately 11 or 1,200 uh, uh, current residents uh, that answered that, and about uh, 200 or so um, from off island. And some of the, obviously the importance around that sense of belonging, uh, employment has come up as obviously a critical uh, factor of consideration. Access to services, i.e., transportation, mental health has been raised, housing has been raised as well. Um, in terms of our division as well, within economic and population growth, uh, current programming and supports, as I mentioned, we have continued to expand settlement supports. Uh, we, we have got moved to multi-year agreements. Um, we have additional navigational services uh, focused on rural as well. Uh, I, I talked about uh, the refugees, uh, government-assisted refugees, uh, but also the Afghanistan 
um, and the Ukrainian efforts as well. So right now, approximately, um, the view is, or, or the anticipation is that we have about 200 additional uh, individuals coming to the province through th these three, three streams. Um, from a Ukrainian perspective, we have about 100 individuals that have arrived, anticipating probably another 35 uh, pending arrivals, and that number could continue out through, uh, through the fall time frame as well. Um, I did want to mention as well that this morning we did actually launch a new uh, gender equity, diversity, inclusivity, and community enhancement program, which we're very excited about. Um, and we're really trying to ensure that both our existing partners, but we can broaden uh, supports uh, for new partners as well that uh, haven't traditionally uh, been able to access funding from us. Um, it's going to be a project based, it's $500,000. And uh, applicants will have until October 3rd to reply. So we've had a lot of ad hoc requests that come into us, and this will give us an opportunity to, from a pilot uh, program perspective, take a look at what's out there, and then we'll make some evaluation once that process has been uh, completed and, and looking at uh, what the future looks like with that program. And in terms of the new population strategy, we are, are in development of that new strategy. There was a motion 95, uh, the renewed focus. Uh, uh, earlier in the, in the legislature, um, and I think the, pot, the way we see the new population strategy is really evolving beyond uh, the population action plan. We see this as a bit more of a connected strategy. We went out to an RFP last week for a consultant to come in and, and help us. We'll provide the expertise in behind, but we'll have that consultant provide some additional capacity for us to uh, develop that plan. Um, so that new plan will be uh, for 2023 and beyond, whether that's a three-year, five-year or longer, I think that's something we will uh, make some determination, make a determination about. Um, we're going to be doing some further consultations and focus groups. Um, it's going to, it has to be a province-wide approach. Uh, right now, we do have a number of partners, obviously, across government, but there has to be um, external partners brought into this in various areas as well, uh, whether that's in terms of infrastructure, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're also going out to um, going to attend our RFP as well for a, a revised or refined, I guess, population forecast. We have those other forecasts that I mentioned earlier, both through the province and stats cam, but it's something that we want to just make sure that uh, we can complement those uh, projections that are out there. We're also going to build into uh, a planning tool. That coordination and planning will be critical moving forward, as, as we've seen. There's a lot of uh, moving parts, a lot of elements to uh, what population growth means. Uh, it's well beyond just our division, our department. It's, it's got to be a whole of government, as I said, and, and bringing in um, uh, existing uh, or, or external partners as well in terms of that work. So that's some of what's happening right now in terms of that strategy. We're aiming to have uh, end of uh, this year, early next year, in terms of uh, uh, releasing of that strategy. Thanks very much. That's perfect. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Mary. So we will uh, open things up to questions, and uh, like I said, if you maybe want to direct your questions to the different presenters, uh, Mary talked more about the labor shortages, but as you also indicated, there is some crossover in maybe some of the questions, so if you do want to add on to any of the answers, just maybe put your hand up or just get my attention. So we'll start off with Gord. Well, thank you. Thank you, presenters. It's, these are very important topics, and um, you know, both labor and um, population are, are keys, and I think they're incredible stressors right now in, in, in Prince Edward Island. Um, my first question is, is to the minister. Being new, um, I, I, I want to know what you're going to bring to these portfolios. What, what do you see? Um, we just had two great presentations. Um, what do you see we have to do within the next year, minister, to, in your opinion, where do you want to take Prince Edward Island with, these, with both labour and population? What are your focuses? Well, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think, uh, as Cal pointed out, with the strategic plan for 2023 20, and beyond, that will be not only my vision, but it will be the province's vision going forward. Gordon? Um, <clears throat> on one of the slides it says, it said, um, labor market tightness. and. I, I, I saw that, and I think we're way above tightness. We are we are in crisis. We're running at a full. Look, I'm out there talking to to people, and you've got people owning companies that are 
putting in 12 to 15 hours just to survive because they don't have people. Um, is that an understatement? Uh, is that, are, we, are we looking at more than just labor and market tightness? And are we doing enough with the planning and with what I saw in here? Are we doing enough to, to sustain? We talked about mental health and well-being. We talked about um, various other things. Are we doing enough? And is that an accurate analogy for the word tightness to describe our labor issues? Mayor? Thank you for the question. Great question. I think, you know, labor market tightness is one element. The labor market efficiencies does follow with that as well. So are we doing enough? We could always be doing more. I think the element is right now we're doing collaboration on a number of pieces and trying to prioritize where investments are going. Um, it's really important for us on underrepresented populations who were not accessing the workforce prior to because they had a barrier to remove those barriers because usually that is the underrepresented population that you know they're not always the first ones hired. So we're doing our investments right now, we're focusing on what I would call pre-employment, preparing people, helping to remove those barriers, doing work with social development and housing, doing work with um, you know, health through addictions, mental health, to try to focus in on what can we do to, to reduce some of those barriers. I agree with you, employers right across the province are, are um, you know, continuously asking for more people, more skills. The element that we see is we have to move in pace with our infrastructure and our requirements in the province. We can't just go and find 500 carpenters to come in and, you know, a couple of high, we, we could never sustain that pace. So we're trying to do it in collaboration with our partners. Um, you know, we know, you know, whether it's trades, whether there's, you know, um, the tradespeople is an example where uh, we need to look at wages, we need to look at skills, we need to look at, um, you know, our apprenticeship type programs. We need to understand why individuals may not be transitioning from K to 12 into post secondary education and what can we do to increase skills so that people are employable. So, are we doing enough? I would say we could always do more. Um, do I do I probably lose a little sleep at night that we need to be methodical and make sure that we're going in step with all of the other aspects that go with workforce? Um, but the, the differences today are very different than they were pre-pandemic, and they will be different again in next year. Yeah. I, pre I appreciate Thank the answer. Board. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. And this is a, a good conversation. I'm just putting, I'm putting it in, in context. I was just at Kent this morning at 7 a.m. and uh, uh, the guy owning a, 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 a company that's doing a major project had 17 employees, lost 12 of them today to going back to school. 12. So he's got to complete different things for, for the province and different big projects. Now and then he just put his hands up and he said, I can only do what I can do. So I, I'm, that's why I guess it's fresh in my mind. That's why I kind of asked that question. And I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm kind of worried because he was worried and he owns a, he owns a, so I, I'm, I'm just saying that we, we can, I feel like we're solving little tiny gaps, summertime gaps. Uh, back to the fall, students go back, we're, we're just solving that. We need to really come back with a plan. And I, I just ask you this, are we considering, are we doing enough? And, and you saw it uh, in the news where a plumber was just taking anybody and was going to train them. Are we doing enough on the job training uh, in the private sector to get people excited? Are we supporting that in our province enough instead of doing it formally with, with, with schooling? Are we doing enough OJT and Prince Edward Island is my question. So you have about three different ah, areas no. there that I'm going to just <laughs> yeah, scribble down. I got to calm quickly. down. But uh, do you know, I, I think the element for us, and, and I spoke about this during the presentation, we have to focus in on workforce on investing in skills of Islanders. So, you know, each day I too get calls of, of the person who lost 12 people to return to school to get a skill. And the element that I, conversation I have with employers is if it is positions where they're unskilled labor, because we do know in uh, positions that do not require post-secondary education are growing in some areas, that we want to invest in skills. 
So if by chance some of those individuals went into trades programs or went back to further their education to be more established in that province, then that has to be our priority. And unfortunately, that does lead to consequences of an employer feeling like I lost people to go back to increase their skills. The unfortunate part is it's really hard to maintain that balance of both, ensuring that someone has labor. You mentioned, you know, whether the employer, whether it was skilled labor or labor that required, you know, a grade 12 education, it's a balance of what we're wanting, but we will always lean to additional skills. It is better if it improves the economic and social position of an Islander. We are doing some work with micro-credentialing. So last year we announced a partnership between ACOA and Holland College where we're engaged with industry to try to figure out, okay, you know, instead of formal post-secondary education, are there micro-credentials where an individual could stay attached to employment and gain the skills? So I think, you know, what you're identifying is we need a number of elements working. It can't just be one pathway, and micro-credentials is something we're focused in on as well. And then I think kind of the, the third component here is, you know, when employers may have required 12 people to do a position, we're talking to them about labor market and, and efficiencies. There aren't necessarily 12 people to do certain roles. And we have employers that are using our workplace skills training program now to invest in productivity improvements where maybe there are some efficiencies that can get created because the competition for labor is so fierce. People will lose positions. In particular, they're going to feel it on retail and front lines where there isn't a requirement for that advanced education component. So um, we are working on a, a plan. It has to be multi faceted and and it's important that no one gets left behind on that plan. Mm -hmm. right. So Gordon, I'm going to go with one more and okay. then I'll continue on. Thank okay, you. Then. Um, so, and that's great. And I just want to give uh, uh, a shout out to, to, to Skills PEI, who really, they do an incredible job with with finding gaps, working with employers, um, to for various other other things, I'm familiar with it. I, when I'm out in the when I'm out in the community, what I'm finding now is because of the stresses that private sectors are under, and I say, have you been to approach the skills program, or, or, or and they, they they respond with, I don't have time. Um, so what I'm what I'm saying is that that's, that's a great program. The the employers are are your your employees are incredible. They do a great job, but the employers are saying that I don't have time to even look at, at finding somebody. So what I'm asking you, is there any possibility that skills could do more of an outreach program um, to go to the work sites and talk to managers, to go out into the community? Is that something that, that, that you could look at to provide respite for employers and, and, and build that relationship? So. Thank you for that. I think, you know, um, just prior to the pandemic, we were launching a modernization piece, and it really is changing from an old business line where you had tons of applications come in and you would assess those applications on eligibility to a role where we're doing outreach. Um, and of course, you know, it, we started this just pre pandemic and it, it did change the dynamics. Your, um, you're right. Uh, employers that know us and have developed a relationship speak very highly of their relationship with our team. But we need to do more for the employers that don't have that time or don't have that relationship. So we have made some adjustments to our staffing model to focus in on outreach. And I think you will see us increase that time allotment to really be out um, helping employers navigate, but also helping our organizations that support clients to be able to navigate. We have increased supports with them, and Cal had mentioned the CBDCs and the different sectors where we have funded outreach HR type positions where employers may not have an HR expert on staff because they're small to provide that guidance and help them with that element. And that's certainly starting to show show dividends from that. But we, we will be increasing our outreach. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. For Trish. now, Thank you, Chair. back on the list. Thank you so much for being here today. For engaging in these really important discussions. Um, I, I think when we look at you know the state we're in here in Prince Edward Island in terms of the labor shortages and 
you know, where we have come with our population uh, strategy, um, where there are gaps, where there were aspects that really weren't considered to the level that they should have been. Um, it's important to take a step back at this stage and challenge, you know, question and challenge what are some of the assumptions that have been made um, in these previous strategies um, and where are the gaps. So I want to just, um, I want to uh, unpack a couple of elements here that I've heard in, in, in the pre presentation today and just allow for further discussion on them, if I could. Um, we've talked a little bit about the importance of investing in people. That's a phrase that's come up quite a few times, and I would say that that's certainly a very important way to, uh, to consider our labor shortages, the people, the workers. Um, I do feel that the large, a large part of that discussion, though, has focused solely on the training aspect and the skills aspect. There's more to the, the uh, building a workforce um, than simply developing skills. We have to look at what is the experience of the workers, what is being done to improve our work conditions on PEI, what are we doing to make PEI the best place to live and work. So I'm wondering if uh, Minister um, or um, uh, Mary, if, if you could elaborate a bit on, on those components. What are we doing? Because we are, as you noted, in, in competition with other provinces for workers. Thank you for the question. I, great question. Um, you know, I know we did speak in this slide presentation a lot about investing in skills, but equally important is that experience. It's looking at the retention. It's looking at, uh, you know, increased wages. It's looking at, you know, being able to economically and social establish within that. We do work, uh, you know, very closely, obviously, with Patricia McPhail, who is responsible for labor relations. The health and safe workplace is extremely important. Our staff, um, you know, we talk about doing outreach and engagement. The tools that we need to have in our toolbox right now are broad, and it, it crosses over pretty well all of our divisions within within economic growth, tourism, and culture for sure. Um, so, you know, the one element that we are looking at is almost like an employer of choice model where you know are do they have practices in place you know has there been you know is, is this seen as a positive workplace culture what are the responses coming from clients who have secured employment so um, you know I, I apologize if we were too slanted on the training and skill side it, it does equally it's equally as important as that experience connectivity and the re and the retention component and that part does cross over a number of divisions within our unit and we're also a consultation with the comprehensive review of the uh, Employment Standards Act right now, so we'll expect a, a consultation report on that this fall. Trish? Yeah, thank you. And um, I apologize for the harsh, harsh question. It's something that I, I do feel very passionately about that, you know, we need to be looking at our labor shortages through the lens and experience of workers. Um, you know, uh, and I think working with industry is critical, and I think quite, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that's gone into that and needs to continue to happen, most certainly. I think one area that we've, we've sort of pushed to the, the side is, is that how can we work more effectively with labor, with our workers, and, and really engage them on, on what, what are their needs. So you mentioned, you know, I've heard um, looking at, looking at things like wages, looking at, you know, safety in the workplace. Um, I'm sure that these are not things that you're just now starting to look at. So what are you finding in terms of wages, for example? Um, I'm looking at some of the highest uh, demand occupations, and I'm seeing several here that would probably uh, fall under uh, lower wage workers. So you know, what have you found in terms of wages and, and how wages might impact uh, retention and recruitment of workers for PEI? So I think, you know, we did see some growth in wages over this past period of time. I think that conversation that uh, Mr. McNeely mentioned, having the conversation with employers, when we look at, so we use uh, labor market tools to look at what the wages are in Atlantic Canada across the country. What are they paying? What are the benefits? What are the opportunities? And we make those decisions when we're determining whether or not a company is going to receive support. We're seeing employers make adjustments 
difference of two, three dollars an hour just by having the conversation. The element that, you know, there's an awareness piece that still is needed with some employers who do feel that there's a lot of labor supply, they're just not in the workforce, that they're on federal benefits or COVID programming or, you know, so there there's so much element of education in this in talking about wages and talking about the competition for labor as well. Um, you know, I, I do think, it, you know, our graduate mentorship program, we just increased it where our, the minimum wage that we would support was $17 an hour. Um, we went out and did consultation with employers to say, if you're paying below that, we're not going to fund positions because this is the average that we're seeing in your sector. It's different industry by industry, sector to sector, um, but it's something that is in front of us every day on our decision making that we're doing. We do know though that there's a balance with wages with economic conditions as well. Um, you know, the Restaurant Association, we've done consultations with them. They can't afford to increase their wages to a point where consumers won't pay for food that's in front of them. So we're trying to balance out those conversations uh, and provide education and awareness and look at increasing the base wage when we are funding to try to get closer and closer to that livable wage conversation. Trish? Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, uh, there's a, a lot that I really appreciate in, in that response. Um, uh, I want to note as well that, you know, these the issues that we're facing around labor shortages, they didn't happen overnight. It feels that way. But um, we've known that, you know, this was coming uh, for a lot of reasons. We have had an aging population for a very long time. Um, I think COVID has certainly intensified, uh, you know, there's people, many people have chosen to retire early perhaps. Um, so I think we've seen there have been impacts from, from COVID that have, have sped that along, but it's not really a surprise that we're, we're in these, these, you know, the challenges that we're facing now. Um, I, I find that the conversation around, you know, what can we do to educate employers as well as to the realities of the current labor market and that it's not that people are, are sitting home on, a, you know, uh, receiving benefits. It's people, Islanders are working, whereas the, as you noted earlier in your presentation, um, the percentage of, of working uh, Islanders in the workforce is higher than ever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I do think there's, there's a lot of education there and unpacking it as to the reality of, of, of where we're at, um, you know, I want to just also know quickly before we move on, I know others have questions too. Um, uh, when it comes to the, the, uh, the population action plan, I think one of the criticisms that we have, um, have seen, and for good reason, would be you know, that it's sort of the original plan or the, the current plan is, has really been in a silo, right, in many ways. Um, you know, we, are, uh, we can't look at how can we grow our population without looking at you know, where are people going to live? You know, is there enough affordable housing? Um, for people to be able to stay and live and raise their families here on Prince Edward Island, for people to come and, and move to the island. You know, do we have adequate health care? Um, you know, we know that the doctor uh, wait list uh, for family doctors is growing and continues to grow. So what will be different about the new strategy um, that will take into account all of the variables that are um, and necessary to understand and and build on to to effectively and safely grow a population in a way that will be a benefit to everybody. I oh, appreciate that question, and I think I did allude to that a little bit in my presentation in terms of the new strategy. And couldn't agree with you more. We heard from uh, a lot of feedback that. Um, it probably was a bit disconnected in terms of some of those action items and, and a lot of those action items were uh, what other departments were doing and how does that feed into a broader um, population action plan but a, a strategy is different than an action plan in my mind a strategy is more comprehensive and overarching i think that the planning piece and the coordination piece is going to be critical um, the population growth has a pulls out a lot of different levers as you say in terms of housing in terms of infrastructure in terms of services so one of the things we are doing is we are um, going to look at having a uh, population or a, a planning tool developed to understand, okay, as population increases, what does that mean? As an example for housing, uh, housing starts over the last five years of being anywhere from 900 to 1,500 housing units uh, in, in an annual, uh, in, a, in a given year. 
with a proper planning tool, that's something we should be able to do some uh, forecasting and get a better understanding of maybe when investments should be made, um, what policy decisions need to be made, keeping in mind housing is outside of our area of responsibility, but it's definitely going to be important to make sure that those that are responsible for housing both um, within the provincial system um, and also those outside of government are, are part of that process. So. A little bit more planning coordination, I think, is going to be critical, and I think your your uh, point is well taken. Trish, maybe one more, and then we'll move yeah. on. That's right. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll just note, and I, I um, appreciate that answer. I do want to know that I think we're we're well beyond the stage, though, of, of it's just a little bit of a disconnect or a little bit of a problem. Um, uh, you know, we are. Uh, I can't tell you how often I hear from uh, from islanders, uh, from constituents who, you know, can't can't find affordable housing that will, um, you know, suitable for their family. Um, you know, there's that they can't find a family doctor, they can't get, you know, the mental health services they need. So there's a real fear out there um, uh, of, you know, we, we're already not supporting Islanders the way they need to be supported currently. Absolutely, immigration is critical. How do we make sure that when we are people are immigrating to the island that we are providing the supports that they need that they have appropriate housing that they have access to health care um, there's there's it's beyond a bit of a problem it's it's a genuine fear uh, and and rightly so that the people are feeling so we need to take this very seriously um, and uh, you know I realize it's outside of your scope and that's not your fault I think perhaps the way that we put things in silos and, and, and have for a very long time in government is, is part of the problem. Um, but I think in terms of developing the strategy, and I realize it probably not at that stage yet, but you're going to need some really concrete action plans, items on, on how, you know, how you're going to really take into consider, consideration all those variables and not get in this, not make things worse. Uh, because we can't, it's not fair to islanders, it's not fair people to people who we're bringing to the island, right? It, it isn't. Um, it's absolutely heartbreaking as well to hear from employers who say, I have a worker who um, I could recruit tomorrow if I could find a place for them to live. So I guess my last question is, you know, to, to the minister um, and, and to, to both of you, is that something that, that you're hearing as well from employers that, you know, I could recruit, um, you know, workers to this island, you know, tomorrow. I have, there's, there's opportunities, but there's nowhere for them to live. And, you know, they're worried. They have a, a health condition that they, they don't think they're going to be able to, to, you know, have cared for. You know, these sorts of concerns. Are you hearing them? And, and what, what are you doing about it? Oh, we're definitely, we're definitely hearing it, but I just want to be clear, you're, you don't want us to stop immigration with your, your, your No, we, absolutely, okay. immigration is important, but we have to do it responsibly. It is right. no, irresponsible. I just, I just wanted yeah, to, to, your lead into your questions seemed to, I didn't know which way you were framing I'm that. I'm happy to clarify that. Okay. Um, no, we're, we're definitely focused on that, and that's cross-part uh, departmental uh, is key to this going forward, and as Cal and Mary have pointed out, that that work's already started and uh, it's well underway. So. And I think in addition to that, I mean, we've obviously continued on looking at um, uh, improving, putting more investments into settlement services, and working with uh, settlement organizations in terms of making sure when people do arrive, they have those supports in place, and, and they're providing definitely uh, overarching and cross-cutting services to individuals as well. So you have to put put the uh, look at those considerations and, and we do continue to look at that when you're talking about housing uh, I mean if you look at as an example Ukrainian initiative people are coming here um, temporary housing usually is, is something that can be uh, um, found it's but finding permanent housing can be a challenge but that's that's a challenge not just within PEI that's a challenge everywhere and we've heard that in terms of our national calls and what's happening so that's why we have to put this plan in place that we're talking about in terms of the tools so we can understand what might be an optimal number in terms of housing units or housing starts so an example yeah i think just to add to that um because we we do get those calls we have those conversations with employers about you know i could hire 
Susie tomorrow if she had a place to live. And I think, you know, what we're doing is we're unpackaging that. Employers are talking to us that, you know, it's no longer just developers or builders that are looking at the housing issue. It's employers are feeling that they're also navigating with their employees on, you know, helping to find a place to live. Some employers are becoming landlords. We know that's adding additional pressure. So we do try to unpackage that, um, you know, on to what role has your company taken to help with that full integration, to introduce to community supports that are out there, but then to also try to, you know, we have some employers who have said, this is not my issue of trying to help, it's everyone's issue, and just trying to unpackage that together. I do think, you know, our department, um, you know, we work really closely with the housing um, division of social development and housing and the other elements so that um, they understand what we're hearing and what we see, and then we understand the constraints that they're facing. Uh, it, it's like any team, when you have your day-to-day -day work and you're trying to do cross-collaboration work, it, it takes the will for everyone to come together to address that. And it may appear to be slow, and I get that feeling, but it's also, it's important work to do methodically as well. Um, so, you know, the fact that we are around the, this discussion point and we're hearing it and we're bringing that voice from, from industry and from islanders is extremely important. So. Thank you, Mary. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for being here today and giving this presentation. I certainly appreciate it. I look at slide 10, your population projections from Stats Canada, and I am curious, I don't know if you would like to address this or the minister. Is our housing on pace to meet these population projections? Uh, that's something we haven't taken a look at yet. Uh, these just were just issued uh, through Stats Canada. So we haven't gone through, this is an hour data, the uh, on slide 10, this is Stats Canada. So we haven't gone through all of these projections yet. And that's something that we're looking at with that planning tool to make sure that we can map that out accordingly. Thank you, Chair. I can appreciate that this particular <coughs> graph might be new, but immigration population projections are not new. So mm. I find it worrying that we haven't done any work to map this out, particularly because on slide two, I believe it is, slide three, excuse me, it lists housing and transportation as one of the original focuses from the 2017 to 2022 action plan, a five-year plan. So there was no work done previously to put a focus on housing? I think there has been a focus on housing, there's been a focus on transportation, there's been a focus on a number of elements through the original plan in terms of uh, having those specific forecasts that you might be talking about in terms of saying these are the projections moving forward the next 20 years, mapping that out in terms of what those the housing units or housing starts needs to look at. Um, I think there's more work to do in that and that's going to be bringing in uh, um, lands planning groups, going to be municipalities, etc. So I think there, there's more work to be done, but housing is definitely, uh, from their perspective, within their department would be, and I don't want to speak for them in terms of the work that they have ongoing and, and uh, others outside of government as well. Thank you, Chair. It strikes me that perhaps you wouldn't have done a 20-year assessment, but in a five-year action plan, making sure that the housing starts, we're going to be on pace with the amount of people we were trying to bring in seems like a, a pretty basic beginning point. If it's not something that was done previously, it's critical in the future. I can certainly understand that housing is outside the scope of your department's responsibility, but from the perspective of a minister, the reason we have a cabinet table is so all cabinet ministers can come together and say, hey, this is outside of my scope, but it impacts it. So I need you focusing on these things. I hear from people every day who are saying the same as Trish had said, I could hire people for these positions if I had somewhere for them to live. I could bring in doctors, I could bring in construction workers, I could bring in ECEs if they had a doctor, if they had somewhere to live. That That's a huge part of the, the story. So I guess one question I will have for the minister more than for the other guests today, do you think, minister, that the cost of rent is having an impact on the economy. The cost of rent is having an impact on the economy. Um, I 
can't answer that right today. You can't? Lynn? Thank you, Chair. No, you, you're... So I'm going to give you an example. I have one woman I was talking to. She's a New Islander who came here to work in healthcare. Right. And I was speaking with her last week, and she had she was delighted to be here and was hired right away and has a great job and is doing the work we desperately need. And she had said to me, I can't believe how expensive rent is. I don't know that I'm going to be able to afford to stay here. It would make every bit as much sense for me to head to another province where I would have higher wages, where I could be with a bigger population of um, people who have a similar background to me, where I would more easily integrate. Do you think that the cost of rent is having an impact on the economy? I think uh, <clears throat> the cost of living is having an impact on the economy, mm -hmm. definitely. And uh, it's right across this country. It's not just Prince Edward Island that we're seeing high rent prices and high housing prices. and. Uh, uh, you, you're seeing the wages increase, as Mary pointed that out, uh, because of the shortages in labor and the demand for the workforce. And all of a sudden, the workforce has the, uh, you know, the power is back in the workforce hand because of the shortage in labor, and there, therefore, you know, uh, this is increasing their wages and their supply. But of course, the rent prices across this island is are are high, but it's across this jurisdiction and. Uh, I'm not sure if she moves to another province that that's going to be any different, but maybe it, maybe it is. But uh, definitely the cost of living is affecting all islanders. But Thank you, Chair. If the cost of rent is exceeding, let's say, 30% of your income, then it is considered unaffordable. That's sort of a baseline metric that people are using everywhere. 30% should okay. be your housing costs. So. Are you going to be advocating, because of the impact it's having on the economy, for there to be some upper limits on rent, or do you think we should raise wages to keep pace with that? Well, that's a good question, and that's something that uh, will definitely be in discussion, but I, I see the wages increasing uh, across this province. You... But... Thank you, Chair. Do you think that the increase in wages is keeping up with that cost of housing? Uh, yeah. Eric. Okay. Eric. Thank you. I think, you know, we're looking at the cost of inflation right now in, in our province and across the, the country and the impact that that has on wages, the impact that rent has on people's decision on whether or not they're going to come to the province to establish. Um, there's no, there's not one solution to this. I think you know, with briefings with our, our new minister, how important it is on that horizontal policy setting, so that we know that, you know, we're, we're reviewing wages, but we also have, we have um, economic stability as well. So there's a balanced approach to all elements. Um, front in mind is people need a place to live that is affordable. They need wages to be able to um, sustain a a life in our province, and it's an ultimate goal for all of us. It's just some of the elements, um, as you can appreciate, we have subject matter expertise on, and some areas it gets to be, it's extremely important to us, but we rely on other divisions, departments to provide that expertise. So absolutely front of mind, but it is a balance between all of those elements. I'm going to go one more, and then I'll throw it over to Michelle for a couple questions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. I absolutely don't expect your department to have expertise in everything, which is why my questions were more to the minister, because it really is the job of a government to be looking at the whole picture. Each department is responsible for its piece, but the minister is responsible for that big picture thinking, and when one component of it is outside of his or her portfolio, he needs to bring that back to the cabinet table for that discussion. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect you to have all of the answers on housing, but I do need to know that these are things that the minister is going to be advocating with the new housing minister on, for example. So I suppose one other concern that I would raise is I am hearing from this individual who has moved here, who is entering the workforce, who is filling needs that are absolutely required by our community. But in order for that individual to be paying a, a $1,500 rent, that 30% affordable range would mean she'd have to be earning $30 an hour. Like, that's a, 
that's a big gap between where our minimum wage is and where the cost of housing is. So I'm just curious, Minister, I guess going back to my original question, can you now see why I think the cost of rent and the cost of housing is an economic concern? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, you can go on. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Hey, thanks, Chair. And again, thank you for being here. Um, so one of the questions that I constantly get, and I, I would like for you to kind of maybe explain this or debunk what the, what the islanders might be considering are the issues, but something that people often say to me is, well, where did all the workers go? So do you have an answer for Islanders? Because we've already explained that our workforce is actually increasing. But now the wage, the f labor force gap is one of the biggest that we've seen. So what is your explanation to Islanders of where all the workers went? Because it seems like they are working. So what's actually going on behind the scenes? Great question, and I, I think you know that's uh, one of the main questions that our staff face when we're out with employers. And you know, when we look at our levels of employment, and we talked about where we are today, it's the highest that we've ever been. We're also facing an aging population, mm -hmm. so um, you know, we are the grayest kind of region in Canada where our average age is below. Immigration has helped bring that average age down somewhat, but we're still aging. So I think, you know, the conversation that we have with employers, we explain our labor force numbers, the employment numbers, the exit rate, the average age to show that shrinking supply of labor. And many times it comes to that realization of we need to grow as a province in order to be able to sustain. It also leads to conversations on, you know, if you had 15 employees that were doing a certain activity, is there a way to look at um, digitization or any other elements that could reduce some of that pressure? So it, it can lead to a conversation on um, automation for some of the skill sets. But we do, we do spend a lot of time debunking the thought that there's thousands and thousands of islanders who are sitting on the, on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to do more? Yes, we do. And I think that's the investments on the HR side to have those dis discussions about, you know, where are the people? Mm -hmm. Michelle? Okay. I appreciate that. And one of the other things is, you know, another statement, which unfortunately we hear a lot is young people just don't want to work anymore, where young people just don't want to work, which we know is not true because we see a lot of young people that are working multiple jobs just to make, and make ends meet for all the reasons that Lynn was just stating, because it's almost impossible to pay rent on $13 an hour, so they're working multiple jobs. And to be honest, the whole back to school, um, I mean, that's a seasonality thing that we got that we normalize for every year. But now that we are extending our tourism season way into September, October, and sometimes even November, that workforce that would have been your traditional summertime workforce is absolutely going back to work, which is where we want them to go so that they can actually increase their wages and, and increase their skills so that they are a skilled labor force. So that's exactly what we want to happen. But we also have to look at our aggressive economic targets as a province through tourism and those kinds of things. You know, like we've heard the economy's on a tear and it's been on a tear for how many years, but we have to recognize that there are things that we need to do in order to be able to sustain that. And if we can't sustain it, then what what are we willing to do? So my next question on that is, are there thresholds in, in place? Um, so when it is indicated that housing's not keeping up, healthcare is not keeping up, some sort of fundamental infrastructure is not keeping up, is there thresholds in place that would indicate a need to slow the growth, the population growth um, strategy down in order for the infrastructure that we have in place to continue to sustain the population that we have currently? Um, outside of those action items or the priorities that you saw in terms of the goals, I'd say those are probably the thresholds you're looking at in terms of saying there's a specific threshold or an optimal level of what population growth should look like. I'd say that's not something that's being developed. I think in terms of the way we look at it and the lens that we look at it and the responsibility that we have, we're trying to ensure that uh, there's considerations and, and those supports are in place to make sure that 
the social and the, the cultural inclusion, um, and, and those economic considerations are taken into account, and, and making sure that individuals that do move here uh, do want to stay here. So we're looking at all those wraparound supports, at least from within our particular division. Um, or in terms of those thresholds, to suggest that we should potentially slow down. No, that's not something that uh, we're taking a look at or saying, well, we don't have housings at X and, and uh, populations at Y, then we should we should turn the tap off. That's not uh, something that we're considering at this point, or we don't have thresholds in place to suggest to suggest that. Jean? Thank you. Or I guess the flip side is, is we have to invest more in housing and other infrastructure in order to keep up, which we haven't necessarily been doing, which is kind of why we're seeing that gap today. Um, I wanted to just quickly talk about, um, I've written so many notes on all of these, um, quickly talk about transportation. So one of the things that we've heard, especially in rural communities, is there's lots of focus on transportation to get people who are living in rural communities into urban centers for work. But where is the focus on ensuring, like making sure that people who live in urban centers who are employed in rural communities can actually get there in time for work? So I'm thinking, you know, people getting out to farms in order to be able to um, take on those roles. But if public transportation or transportation is a factor, we look at it to bring people in, but we don't look at supporting those employers that live, that work and operate businesses in rural communities to ensure that the bus is going to get there for 8 o'clock in the morning? So a couple of things. There are roads that go from rural to urban to urban to rural. Mm -hmm. The conversation that we're having, and I'm thinking of one a couple of weeks ago with a major employer, is there are times when your standard hours of operation do also need to be adjusted and be flexible for whether it's childcare pickups, you know, whether it's transportation pieces. And employers are investing more and more in that transportation piece. So I think, you know, we do that horizontal work with rural development um, who lead the transportation component. We were very active with tourism on increasing the routes that went from, uh, you know, the Summerside Kensington area into Cavendish to try to address some of the shortages. So I think we're always conscientious of rural and urban and funding the, the different elements. But we've also had to have the conversation with employers about, you know, if, if you're employing people who, you know, maybe single parents, maybe individuals who have childcare pickups, there needs to be that flexibility in the balance mm -hmm. um, for the work schedule uh, to be able to adjust to that. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to go one more question there, Michelle. I can put you back on the list if you want. Yep. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so we talked about housing. And we kind of talked about scope, and whether it's in scope or out of, out of scope of your specific department. But I'm, I'm just going to simply say that housing is a human right. So it's a, it, within the scope of all of us. Health care, universal health care, is a human right. So it is within the scope of all of us. And so when we're developing strategies, especially action plans, ensuring that we take care of those human rights to make sure that everything is in place, that is incredibly important. And I understand the siloed impact of, you know, this planning process and this population growth strategy, but it has desperate, desperately hurt um, across across um, the board when it comes to like being able to provide enough health care for everybody. Like we're seeing people obviously leaving and retention is an issue in healthcare. And when I was listening to your presentation on this, I, um, especially in the labor shortages and healthcare shortages, it's drastic right now. It's crisis mode right now. But there's hardly anything, and this wasn't new. That we were, we've known about this for 20 years that it was coming, but nothing in the population growth strategy during, like for the retention and for the recruitment even mentions healthcare. And one of the things that you had mentioned was the labor relations piece. We have a lot of healthcare workers that are working without a contract and have been working without a contract for years. So, and that's within, um, that's within your department. So what is being done to ensure that the labor force is actually being treated with respect? Because that's what, that's really what it comes down to and negotiating you know, labor contracts, it's based, it's looking after, you know, the, the rights of workers. What's being done to ensure that all of those contracts are being negotiated and 
fairly negotiated. Contract negotiations sit within a different division. I think it's it's a priority for our management team. We have these discussions, but I wouldn't be comfortable providing no. a response to that area. And I think we could probably get back to you with, with some more information on that. Okay. Or try to see what we'll look into that. Perfect. Thank you. Gord. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, population. Um, on number seven, where it says retention of international students, retain 10% of international students, meeting uh, dash measurement. So you're trying to retain 10% of the graduating international students? Is that correct? The original population action plan stated that as a priority or goal. Yeah. Yes. So well, how, how are we doing with that? It can be difficult to measure, but uh, based on what you are seeing in terms of the number of uh, international students trying to get connected to the workforce, we've put in uh, various supports through uh, Atlantic Student Development Alliance, uh, Study and Stay, which is obviously in their last year uh, prior to yeah. entering the workforce. Um, uh, Mary's shop with workforce has done some uh, work with international students as well. So we are starting to see, we see more, uh, at least from my purview, and if you want mm -hmm. to add on um, uh, those individuals that are looking towards uh, permanent residency and, and trying to stay in the province. So. Yeah, Gord? And I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I am a huge fan of, of retaining. If they're here, they've, they're, they're building connections. That's where our population should be maintaining a stay. What I'm, uh, you know, this summer, two things happened, and I, I watched two things happen that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. One is they closed the beaches uh, in PEI. They said, don't come to the beaches. They're full. I didn't think I'd ever see that in my lifetime in Prince Edward Island. The second one was we have our main, main institution, UPI, said, don't come to our island. Don't come to our island unless you have housing. We don't have housing for you. And those... Those two things, I'm more focused on the latter, um, were, were, were were it was it was hard to take, and we're talking about retaining, but we we can't we haven't planned enough to allow people to come to Prince Edward Island that should be here, and the last couple of years we we've used hotels we've we've done whatever we can, and I represent a district that's very close to U, to UPEI. And I don't know of one single place that somebody could rent. Um, and this is a planning issue. And this is, this is going to be a major issue. I know there's a new residence. I know that's coming. Um, it would have been nice to have that ready now for, to, to help us solve the short-term problem, but it's not. Th this trend is, go is going to get worse. Minister, what are we doing to alleviate that now in Charlottetown? But is, sorry, Gordon, is your question specific to the presentation or is it specific to housing? It, it is. We're talking about population growth and, well, we, and we, just re, we just rejected 150 people coming to the island. So it is definitely so, in this so presentation. Okay. Can you clarify your question then, maybe, please? Minister, you see that happening. You're, you're the new Minister of Economic Growth. What is going through your head and what do we have to do so that this doesn't happen again? Thanks, and it's a great question, and it's a question that uh, is very concerning for, for, for everybody on this island, and uh, we know in the short term the, the new residents will help. It will help. UPI does have a plan. Uh, as far as Charlottetown, i got to think it's, uh, more than just Charlottetown. i got to think of the whole island when we... Uh, but I know that the new housing minister is... Uh, very, very, very engaged, and uh, these are kind of questions I'll have with him, conversations I'll have with him, and uh, we'll make sure that our immigration and uh, goes along with our housing, and because uh, we, it has to be uh, equal. You know, we can't uh, put one in front of the other. So it's we just got to move with uh, uh, caution and uh, make sure we do everything uh, in uh, in step. Yeah. Gord. I mean, this is a good discussion to have because this is what we're like. And I said Charlottetown because I'm an MLA in Charlottetown, but it is a province-wide issue for sure. I I, I agree with that. Um, but it's it's very concerning because a lot of the people that we're talking about that 
that maybe didn't come to Prince Edward Island are people of color. Have we, have we done enough for them? You know, out of those people, how many people of color did we miss out on having come to Prince Edward Island to study, to train, to, to potentially stay here? Um, and then, Minister, I, I've, been, I've been lobbying. I know this, this is covered in labor and, and population growth with diversity and uh, inclusion and um, various other things, incredibly important. And I, I will be relentless on this file coming forward. Um, and one of the things I want to ask is that the Black Cultural Society, and this is part of the population, this is in the presentation, we, we talked about it in the speech from the throne. I've talked about these questions. In the speech from the throne, there was money promised to the Black Cultural Society, grants and, um, and loans that I don't think has been there, about $100,000. So we're talking about almost two years now. That money hasn't gone into the community, but yet the presentation is full with um, this is an important for us, but that community never received the $100,000 and um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I have seen anything, and I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I'm getting a little fired up, and I'm trying to stay calm, <laughs> no, but this is important. We're working with BIPOC on that funding, and uh, we're, we need participation from both sides, and uh, we're willing to work with them um, to mm -hmm. make sure that happens. And uh, I, I don't know if we Yeah, so in that. terms of Black Culture Society and BIPOC Usher, so we have funding agreements with them uh, in place, and we're working towards multi-year agreements this year. They've had, uh, obviously, those organizations. Uh, we've spoke to them, um, and I'm not sure if you're referring to the grants in terms of the uh, Black Entrepreneurship Program dollars that they're looking at. That's something that will be is being worked on and, and aiming to be out by uh, in the Q3 this year as well. So I know that's, and that delivery is through Black Culture Society. I'm not sure if you're referencing anything else beyond that or if you want to provide some clarity. Yeah, Go uh, on. And I know I One more. One more question. <laughs> I'll compliment you and your work because I'm hearing good things about the relationship that you've built with these organizations. What, what I'm referring to is in the speech from the throne, it's not good enough to put something in the speech from the throne, wait 19 to 20 months during a pandemic when that money could have been out in the community. And I don't know, and I've been asking, and I've, I've heard various piecemeal things, so I'm starting to get some details now. It, I don't think the program was developed. I think it was put in the speech from the throne um, as something, and I've, I've pressed. I want to make sure um, maybe even schedule a meeting with you about this stuff because it's it's important to me and it's just gone on too long I've tried to be polite about it. and I know you're working hard with let me, it. Let me look into this and uh, okay. circle back with you and definitely meet with you. Okay, perfect minister And these are the kind of conversations. Here's my question. Okay. <laughs> well, that wasn't the question. That was, no, the question. that wasn't that was a comment but okay. I appreciate it. Retention, retention of, of, of people coming in. I see the stats um, 22 2200 to 2500 people per year Retention is, an, an, is, is a very difficult thing, especially within the Indian community. The people coming from India coming here are coming to Brampton and then coming to Prince Edward Island because we have good policies about uh, PR. We do have good policies. When the PR is over, they're returning to Ontario or Brampton. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this in my community. Can you comment on that? And is there any changes we can do, or is it a federal program that, that we can look at retaining skill, skill or just, just people coming in to, to Prince Edward Island uh, to expedite their PR versus the Ontario policies? So um, that it, it, that's an immigration question, mm -hmm. but, I, you know, we don't separate different nationalities based on the retention element. I, I think one of the elements that you're talking about are international students and the choice that they make to come to the province. I think from a workforce perspective, we're trying to embrace all people who are coming to move uh -huh. here. Um, you know, the immigration department is working on retention strategies. Employers do make the choice as to who they're hiring, who they're supporting through the immigration pathways, trying to ensure we remove all barriers so that they want to stay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hear things that, you know, having access to cultural activities, having more diversity mm -hmm. connectivity into uh, festivals and events. So we're trying to unpackage what leads to more positive retention levels. Mm -hmm. And and what I can tell you is it's not one nationality over any other. I think it's it's that integration piece. 
with international students, so you know, there's an element of the federal government with dual intent, right? An international student to get a uh, permit to come study here cannot tell an immigration officer they're wanting to go live in that province permanently. They'll be declined. So there's a lot of complicated yeah. aspects around this file uh -huh. that makes it really difficult to measure out retention. Uh -huh. And I think there, you know, just on the international student piece, I can think of three federal departments, uh, four different divisions within the province, all with different aspects, trying to remove what those barriers yeah. are. Yeah. We face the barrier where we can't fund international students with federal transfers. It has to be 100% funded through the provincial government. Mm -hmm. So the, the issues are really complex, and yeah. even trying to figure out what component of responsibility it falls within does take time. Mm -hmm. And the schools recruit based on certain disciplines of study. It's not like we can say recruit X to fill workforce. The schools have recruitment strategies as well. Um, with different programs that they're administering. So it is, it is yeah. complex, but one that we need to definitely impact. Awesome, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Gord. Trish? Thank you. And that this is such an interesting conversation and so important. And I actually almost think, uh, well, not almost, I do think that perhaps there is a whole other um, meeting that we should be having, particularly on international students and the issues around retention and, and how um, those goals are set. Um, you know, you said different uh, different schools, different uh, departments, different programs have different goals for how many international students, why that is. There's so many questions here. And the interaction with the federal element that you're describing, um, you know, this is uh, quite honestly news to me. I didn't realize it was so complex and that there were so many layers to, to go through because I think you know, with such an opportunity, we have uh, fantastic international students who come to study on PEI and they choose to come to PEI. So what an opportunity to retain those incredibly skilled um, individuals um, to, to stay and live and work, you know, permanently. So just that's perhaps we'll talk about that later because that uh, I feel like there's way more than we can get through on that today. Um, I will just ask one question on that though. The the goal of retaining 10% if I was trying mm -hmm. to find that in the where exactly it was in here. but. Um, I'm just wondering why 10, that seems so low. Um, it just seems again like such an opportunity. How did how did that become the, the goal of retaining only 10%? Well, it predates me. So I okay. started in this I role in 2019. Know. So in okay. terms of where that threshold or priority, it was, it was the uh, government of the day that would have set that. I'm not sure who came to the forefront with that particular percentage, so. Yeah. Trish? Yeah, and I think that's why it is so important that we are, you know, you are developing a new strategy. Um, do you have timelines for when we will actually, um, that will be uh, ready, when it will be published and public, publicly available for folks to yeah. look at? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are going to RFP, a couple different RFPs, okay. so that a lot of that work should be done by the end of the year, and then we'll obviously look to uh, uh, have that new strategy in place sometime in uh, early 2023. In early 2023 mm -hmm. is when we could expect that. Rich? Okay. Um, one of the issues we, we haven't really unpacked here today um, in, at great length would be young workers in particular. So um, retaining um, young islanders here on Prince Edward Island. You know, I hear from so many um, young people that are kind of making those decisions about, like, what, what am I going to do when I finish school? What, what are the next steps? And there seems to be this real... Um, belief or concern that in order to gain the experience that you, you need in, in, in different fields, many different fields, you're going to need to leave the island and then maybe come back later. Um, is that something that, that you've heard? Is that something that you're concerned about? And how can we, um, how can we address that? So well start. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think we're doing work with the Department of Education on transition pathways and career awareness within the K-12 system. Because uh, you're right, I think, you know, the, the, the different categories of influencers on whether or not you can make a career and be successful in Prince Edward Island, um, you know, making sure that there is an awareness of what are those career opportunities is uh, critically important at a young age. 
where it used to be grade nine, grade 10, when people were going through a different programming, now it's really from an earlier age. So there is the, there's a youth transition uh, position that's been created to look at all of the different pathways that people take, whether it's direct to, to employment, whether it is direct to post-secondary education in the province, out of the province, and how students are getting access to career awareness information. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that piece does sit with Department of Education, but we're on that committee working on those different pathways. You, uh, in our, our trades priorities for 22-23 and moving forward, there is um, that increase in providing recognition for um, students at an earlier age towards pathways to trades. So there's a number of initiatives that we're working on collectively to try to uh, debunk some of the information that that people may be providing to youth that you know there isn't a career go go away to get some experience and then come home when you're ready to raise a family and that's been something that I think has been ongoing for a long time in our province. Okay, Trish. Yeah, and how are you measuring the the uh, the effectiveness or success of these efforts to uh, to um, encourage young people to want to, to stay and, and work on Prince Edward Island and that, to let them know that they can uh, make a viable career in life here. So I think for for us, we have a uh, responsibility for apprenticeship. So we're measuring youth um, participation in apprenticeship and what that average age is. And, and when we started to do our review, we were finding that we were into our 30s before people were participating in apprenticeship. And we want that average age to be 16, 17, 18, where they're working during the summer or they're getting some experience. Mm -hmm. So we have a metrics in place right now to measure, um, you know, the trades component for youth. The the career awareness one is based on the programs that are developed in in the schools and and how decisions are made. And then the transition pathways would each have metrics on, you know, are people if they are making the transition from K to 12 directly into the workforce, what has influenced that decision um, around those pieces. Church. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, uh, some of those metrics on, on how people are making those decisions, what's influenced those decisions, that sounds like a lot of, you know, sort of some qualitative work. Um, is that uh, information that you would be able to share with this committee? We could certainly share on the apprenticeship side that okay. sits within our department, and we could, you know, certainly make the contacts with Department of Education on the elements that they're working on on their planning component. Okay. Yeah. Well, one more there, Trish, if that's all right, and then we'll move along. We still have a few more members with questions. Right, yes. I can put you back on the list. Um, just one more quick question, something we um, didn't touch on too much. One of the um, the last plan, one of the, the goals was to promote business startups. So I wanted to just touch on that briefly, if, as I understand it. That was one of the original goals. So, um, you know, uh, how... Uh, the performance of business startups is that have you seen those businesses generally uh is there a good success rate for business startups still on the island um is that going to be you know do you see that as an area of focus um and uh, and what uh, what sort of um areas are we looking you know to uh, to establish new business startups where where does that fit into this plan yeah i think this would be a little bit of outside of my mandate particularly not not in terms of the overall population strategy but just in terms of my area of responsibility but uh, definitely something we'll follow up with Innovation PEI, but I think business startups is, is something that is a focus and it's something that um, should be retained as a focus within the new strategy. It's just a matter of what that looks like. It was obviously not a specific uh, quantifiable metric that was identified in the, in the last uh, current strategy or the action plan, so I think that's something we'll have to take a look at. Can I ask one more quick yeah, question? Yeah, this will be super quick. So I'm just wondering, you know, something else to keep in mind moving forward with the new action plan, the new strategy. Um, uh, you mentioned metrics and things that are being measured. It would be really helpful to have um, some regular reporting on, you know, the success or where where there are challenges in, in meeting those goals rather than sort of waiting, you know, we're, we're getting some of that here today. But um, having that be something, a regular check-in, more regular, would be very helpful just to know how that is, how that's going. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Lynn? Here. Um, I have a few different topics that I would just like to follow up on, if that's okay. On the Population Action Plan, I heard you say that you're hoping to have that new strategy in 2023. I'm just curious if there's going to be an opportunity for the public to consult on that. Will there be an opportunity for feedback? 
Yeah, so we have a couple of things. We have gone out already through, as I mentioned, uh, the island uh, studies faculty did help. That was quasi-consultations in terms of doing that survey work. We are going to be, as part of some of the consultations uh, through the consultant, is, is work doing some focus groups. So there should be some opportunities there. Uh, we'll have to discuss a little bit in terms of what broader consultations look like. I think there's there needs to be a feedback uh, mechanism there and, and people to be able to provide inputs. So we're going to take a look at that as part of that strategy. Great question. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Next question. Thank I was going to ask that one. I was going to ask that one. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Great question. Uh -huh. So my next question for you, I'm curious on who some of those key stakeholders are. I, th I think as part of the strategy, we'll identify specifically who the stakeholders will be when we go to those different focus groups. Yeah. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I must have misunderstood what you had said. My apologies. I thought you had indicated that your um, consultant was already communicating with key stakeholders. I was just wondering. No, no. We only went to RFP oh, yes, last of course, week. Of course, of course. Issue, yeah. My apologies on that. The next question that I have for you is also on international students, actually. I also thought the 10% margin was a low figure, and I understand that that mm -hmm. was determined as a target before you came into this position. Mm -hmm. But I know I have heard anecdotally from a number of international students when they're finishing up their education that they'd be really interested in staying on PEI, but not enough is done to support them and make that mm -hmm. possible for them to easily stay. And I was just curious what the new um, strategy proposes to do differently. Well, we haven't developed the strategy yet, but I think international students is obviously a critical area to focus on, and we're going to have to look at what those supports look like and, and embed that within the strategy. I think it's, I guess it's how how uh, how broad and, and how detailed we want to get that strategy, but I think international students will have to uh, be a key key uh, consideration within the strategy. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Just jumping off of that. Have you heard what the main challenges are that international students are facing that we're trying to address in the new strategy? Well, it's interesting. We we had a case team. We had two case teams that actually just came in to uh, did some work uh, for the department, and, and we put in actually a, a case and a question about international students and what are maybe some of the gaps, areas of improvement or consideration. So they, they had... Uh, done uh, various uh, discussions with uh, international students in terms and they provide us with some presentations in terms of some areas they could focus on so I think I think transportation did come up in terms of some of that flexibility making sure in terms of uh, trying to get to and from uh, classes could could additional routes be added in terms of uh, daily routes uh, from uh, to make sure they can get to classes um, transportation was definitely one of them um, some of the other areas, I, I guess, in terms of that uh, labor market connectedness, they said the programs that are currently existing were helping, but there's probably a little bit more to do in terms of that. Whether it's uh, the study and stay program, their individuals had talked about that, uh, saying that was a good program, as well as the work with uh, Atlantic Student Development Alliance, what I mentioned, saying that's there. But I think there's, could there be more there in terms of supporting uh, from an employment side? And I know that... Uh, workforce has done a lot in that space as well. So, I mean, employment is a big concern, especially for those that are graduating. Uh, transportation was an element. Um, and I, I think just in terms of looking at transport, uh, transpar transparency, getting out uh, communication, that, that community and uh, social inclusion piece, I think is something else that um, should be focused on as well and there were some questions around how can individuals and international students get more involved in the community and, and build those relationships and connections on the island hence the program that we launched today those are the types of dollars uh investments that we'd see or potential projects and initiatives may be coming through that type of program that was launched this morning so those were some of the initial feedback that we got through those through those uh the two uh, case study teams that did some of that work I think just to maybe add to that, you know, the program that we created to support international students through the graduate mentorship program that the province is funding, all of the international students are working with a case manager who is tracking information, providing case notes. So we'll have mm -hmm. that pilot of three years of information to see what worked. The ultimate goal is to attach all graduates to their field of study where they feel that the skills they obtained are being valued and they're being compensated for appropriately. So that program has grown 
uh, fairly significantly. It doubled in size during the pandemic, and we've been very vocal with the federal government of <coughs> requesting some financial support so that we can continue to build. Right now, they can only be supported once they receive permanent residence, and that is usually a journey after they made the first connectivity. So we'll have that data as well from the different case managers supporting international students. Sorry, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. That's really interesting. I will look forward to hearing a little bit more about that as you have more information to share. So thank you for that. The only other thing I was wondering about, I know I'm hearing of certain sectors that are facing unique labor challenges in the years to come. We're anticipating, for example, a lot of people retiring from construction, but it's not just construction that that's true for. I was curious if the new population strategy aims to try to bring in um, people with skill sets to fill some of those anticipated future shortages or how you are imagining addressing some of that? Is that largely through education on this side of it? Well, I think as we go through the strategy, I think we're not focusing on what makes sense, but I think there's things happening today, both um, through occupation and demand to the immigration side, which I won't speak more to. That is a different division and then uh, work that Mary's doing as well on workforce and not to pass over to you, but I know you're doing uh, specific occupational and sector focus as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're, we're doing an assessment with all of the sectors on, okay, you know, what can be filled through uh, training that's happening here? What can be filled through recruitment, whether it's internationally or domestically? Um, to try to figure out how to fill the shortages. And all of the sectors are a little bit different depending on what their needs are. If it's a post-secondary education and beyond, if it's, um, if it's not. So the strategy can be different. Occupations in demand, partnering with our immigration colleagues mm -hmm. uh, where we've identified a list of occupations. You'll see many of them are, were also reflected in our slide on the occupations that have shortages. So it, it's trying to identify where we need to recruit domestically, internationally to fill vacancies where we need to increase training, whether it's resident care workers, LPNs in PEI, um, versus uh, where we need to work with industry to create things like micro-credentialing to try to um, make that gap smaller. So it depends on what the sector is. What I can tell you is we're involved pretty well with all of the sectors now where we've done uh, workforce planning led by industry funded by government, which is really important to us that we provide the funding, we agree to the scope of what they're, they're um, using as an RFP, but the industry groups are leading their workforce planning components. Um, and I know we've, we've done three in the last year with different sectors. So. Thank you, I'm good chair. Hi, uh, Michelle. Great, thanks chair. So I just have a couple or a few more. Um, so I have a question, one that I'm not sure we kind of really dug into yet, but I hear from many women, especially those trying to get back into health care after maternity leave, that they can't go back to work because there's no child care. And so how are you working with that department to ensure that people who want to get back into the workforce actually have that opportunity because their children are being taken care of? So this is, you know, a very relevant for us. It's near and dear uh, to my heart for sure. Just, uh, you know, uh, requiring childcare aspects over my career. I think we've been working with early childhood, both the ECDA, the association, and the department over the past number of years. We doubled funding uh, two years ago to really get at both, you know, the spaces, but plus the the industry had done work to um, scope out what their gaps were and we were seeing that the skills gap was growing where individuals were working in the sector whether it was because of wages whether it was just um, they didn't have the opportunity to get the credentialing component so we've increased funding for that connectivity we created a program called um, steps I shouldn't even name programs because I'll get it mixed up, but uh, a new initiative with ECDA and with uh, College DeLille and our Francophone uh, members so that we have a backfill program so that early childhood educators can participate in increasing training and, and there's a new program to help fill vacancies. So I think, you know, what I would say on, on this initiative is um, 
we have a very strong working relationship with the associations and the centers, uh, and we hear from um, females quite frequently um, that the challenge for them to join the workforce is because of childcare. Uh, and, you know, increasing our investments, we see that op as an opportunity, the $10 a day childcare and the new initiatives that have been launched, we feel strongly have led to a quicker return to, to females in the workforce. Um, you know, we do have some challenges with respect to, um, you know, uh, the hours of operation for mm -hmm. childcare facilities do not always match the hours of operations uh, with employers. Uh, and we're having those conversations more and more about, you know, if you have an employee that you can hire, is there flexibility that you can do here so that they can balance out requirements at home and requirements in the work? So I think the investments have absolutely increased. Um, our partnership is strong and looking at uh, alternate ways to fund initiatives has been key. Michelle. Thanks, and I appreciate that. And it sounds like a lot of work. There's two things that, so a suggestion I've received is any employers over a certain number of employees, can they not offer childcare on site? So for instance, when you look at Health PEI, right? Like we have thousands of people working within Health PEI, many of which are women. Um, we've advocated for this a lot. Like, can you not have a childcare at the hospital so that that works those flexible hours or with, within a certain vicinity of the hospital? If we are enticing large companies to come into the province that would be large employers, would it not make sense to give some incentive for them to actually have childcare on site so that um, that is not a issue that their employees have to worry about? So instead of doing it after the fact, while we're setting it up in the first place, encourage that and in incent that. We know we need it, right? The other thing that I've heard is that registry and how disappointed people are in how the registry, the child care registry works. So I've spoken to many women who put their names on the registry the day they found out that they were pregnant. And within a month of going back to work, they still haven't even heard from somebody from the registry. And what they've been told is, just keep calling every day, call the daycares, maybe a spot will open up. But a woman shouldn't have to, a woman is on maternity leave to bond with her child and to create that relationship and to take that time with their family shouldn't be that stress level of constantly having to call a childcare center because they feel like they're harassing them. So there, I would ask that as part of this process that you figure out a different registry so that it, the onus is not on the person that's supposed to be at home taking the time to bond with their family, but the onus is actually on the province to create a better registry so that they aren't spending so many hours on the phone doing that. That's what I would we'll take ask. Education. Yes. Thank you. Good because job. I think that that is huge for employers so that their employees can take the time that they need. And then I have one final question. Well, it's not. I've, um, okay. Des domestically and internationally trained healthcare workers have a significant challenge when they come to this province to get licensed. Um, are you, and you've talked about working with APAC and um, other organizations, um, are you working around licensing cr and, and credentials and that kind of thing to even like Atlantic provinces having the same licensing protocols, right, and credential requirements? Are you working to remove the barriers there, especially with healthcare workers, because we hear about it all the time of, you know, maybe a nurse coming in, but they, you know, don't have the right credentials or whatever, and then working on upskilling or whatever it is that they need in order to complete that training so that they can enter into the workforce quicker hmm. from the healthcare perspective. I guess a couple of thoughts on that. From, we do have the foreign credential recognition file, uh, also labor mobility, which is on the domestic side. So you had mentioned domestic. I'm not sure. So if, it, if there's a healthcare worker that's licensed, um, reasonably there should be labor mobility across oh, jurisdictions across Canada for the most part. So um, with, and that pathway should be a little bit different than the international side. 
On the international side, a couple things. We do have the, obviously, which you're probably aware of, is the uh, RM bridging program, registered nurse bridging program that we work through ESDC, and that's continuing on. So that, that's through us, through ESDC, um, and, and the Department of Health and Wellness is um, um, managing that program. Um, it has come up in terms of what that looks like in terms of trying to expedite those pathways, and I think that's a conversation that it's a pretty big conversation to have, and how can you expedite those pathways to ensure, uh, obviously, this, there are certain standards that have to be met um, in term, before you can license. So um, it's a big question, and, and it's uh, obviously you have to speak with regulators and everybody else to see how that might be able to happen. And in terms of um, specific, uh, uh, I guess, actions right now, I think it's just, at least from at least where we said this, it's come up quite a bit. Uh, we're seeing other jurisdictions saying, is there anything we can do in this space, uh, whether it's looking at language requirements or, or, um, or Canadian experience or whatever you, whatever you might have in any of these regulated occupations, including health. So, uh, but right now, it's uh, I wouldn't say there's anything necessarily concrete in terms of how we can expedite. But unless Mary on your side, you have anything further. But I know it's something that everyone is trying to get additional, especially in the health side, trying to have, find ways to make those pathways and expedite them quicker. It's just a matter of how that can can happen. Jean. Okay. Thank you. And. Um, I guess one final question. Uh, Mayor, you had mentioned about training programs in rural communities and that you're looking at two rural communities right now and needing to have enough people registered in order to make it worthwhile to have those. Um, have, do you correlate the, you know, potentially the long-term care homes in, um, and who have the largest shortages? Like, for instance, Colville Manor came up several times when we were meeting with the, the um, the PEI nurses union um, and how low their their labor was and it was critically low at one point do you work like with communities like in that instance like with Surrey because I know Surrey would love to have an LPN or an RCW program run through that community I've, I've spoken with them and I know that there's a lot of interest because really what it comes down to is is where you train is where you build your roots where you build your um, you know, like your relationships with colleagues and that kind of thing, and you tend to stay where you train often. There's, there's a lot of evidence around that. So are you going out to all of the different municipalities, especially those that have long-term care homes that have flagged that they're, you know, in desperate need of having additional workforce and encouraging people to go into, like, the RCW program or the LPM program? So, great question. Uh, I think the first step that we do is we work with the sector to identify what do they have currently for needs. So you mentioned Colville and Surrey, and yes, absolutely, we've been up to meet with, with the town officials as well as health officials, um, and certainly Dr. Malone, who's been in the media speaking about this, has been very vocal on the need for a program. So we know the need in their forecast is there. What we're doing right now is we're trying to identify the, the opportunity for individuals to participate and take the training um, and the timeline associated with that as well as the curriculum that's required. So we had made a commitment um, early on 2022, we expanded into Alberton. So Alberton ran, is running a September intake of resident care workers. We are in Surrey now um, having those discussions with the hopes to have early 2023. Um, we've been through different cycles of of how to do the planning. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned is we really can't just build it and people will come. Right. We don't have enough people that can participate in training. Mm -hmm. So we do an assessment on demand with health, private homes as well, because they have mm -hmm. demand. And then we do um, a marketing component to try to ensure that we have enough students to fill the course. We know that, um, you know, there. There has been some challenges with, you know, individuals who may start programming and find that it's not the appropriate pathway. So we're trying to really do some upfront work with the career counselors through our network of external service providers, which you can then hear from people, you know, they're asking me to do way too much work to determine that this is an appropriate mm -hmm. career path. It's because of attrition levels that we're trying to address and make sure that people are, are going in with their eyes wide open of what to 
does it mean to work within this field? So yes, we are into the rural communities um, based on the need. Um, when we do fund a new initiative, a resident care worker program would run approximately $250,000. So you, know, you can see why we would want to have 12 to 14 graduates mm -hmm. successfully come out of a program. Great, thank you. Um, uh, just a quick question. Thank yeah. you for your time. Um, two questions. I'm going to put them in one. Basically, it was about the Alberton program and about uh, the, the LPN RCW program. Um, there was talk in here about return of contribution in the legislature that wasn't in there initially. Um, can you just talk about w what what is in there now? And uh, a specific question that I had. Uh, somebody was going to take the, the program but couldn't afford the books. Um, is there any, because the books are quite expensive, um, that was just came to me anyway, so I just wanted to kind of ask that. Is, have, you, have you noticed that? Is that a barrier? We're just trying to eliminate barriers, so um, those are my two questions, is the return of contribution and, and anything about books for those programs. So the return and service agreement for public sector healthcare positions really does rest with the employer being the public sector. Um, we as training providers, we track, we track clients um, over a 24 month period after they graduate. So, you know, it, when you look at resident care workers, we have a very high percentage that work full time in the field. LPNs as well, but they traditionally are working less hours. So the return and service component does sit with, with our health colleagues. Um, cost of books was added in last year as one of the funding elements. So if they meet the funding requirements through Skills PEI, we do offset the cost of books. There are some programs where there are book costs and then there are uniform costs or some other elements and we're trying to kind of go as far as we possibly mm. can to support the clients. We work closely with student loans to, you know, if we can't provide grant, is it eligible under their loan component to really address the affordability component of training. Great. We'll end on a positive note. Gore? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, cool. Any other questions? I, I just ask one quick question. Um, first of all, it just kind of touched on what Michelle had mentioned there. With the population strategy, um, you had mentioned that you're, you know, there's no plan to kind of decrease the immigration or whatever, but is there a number that PEI, it's like, oh my goodness, like that number, like, you know, looking at 2035 when there's going to be over 200,000 people on the island, you know, like that's only, what, 17 years from now, right? Like, or sorry, my math is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> been a long day, but you know what I mean. But like, is that number that that is a number that like? Because you know, when you talk to everyday islanders, they're like, it's crazy. You know, the population has grown by thirty thousand people in the last twenty years, right? Like, you know, we see it, we live it. But is that a number that? Yes, that's that's kind of the reality of it. Well, I think first off, those are two different projections, uh, yeah. looking at different uh, scenarios. Um, and, and uh, changes in, in different conditions and, and considerations. I think that's why we want to have our own population forecast and planning to, to help complement some of that work. In terms of uh, developing like an optimal level, um, that I look at it more, are we developing the optimal level in terms of the, the conditions in terms of and different considerations of when people are here and um, whether that in terms of the supports they might have and, and making sure they have social uh, and, and uh, cultural inclusion and that, those economic considerations. Whether there's an optimal level of population, don't know, <laughs> but it's it's something uh, when we start going through this work, we can we can start to look at that. I think it's it's based on probably what you're, what do you look at in terms of those infrastructure yeah. and the investments and everything else and what, you, uh, what makes sense in terms, of, it's probably more timing than anything when things are happening. So okay. I'll have to take a look at it. Okay, perfect. And uh, just one quick question for you, Mary. Just at the slide 11 there in your presentation, like, am I not mistaken that there's more older people going, like, they're staying in the workforce longer, is that correct? They are. I think, you know, certainly from 2010, 12, we started to see people were working longer, yeah. um, whether it was to offset pensions for sustainability of income, there were a lot of different factors, but the overall population group is also increasing. So when you look at that total number, you have to take into context the total population piece of um, how many would be in the workforce. And just to follow up on that, is that similar to Atlantic Canada? It is. It is. Okay, yeah. perfect. 
That's great. Well, I do want to thank you uh, very much for coming in to present. Um, and this has been uh, very, very informative. A lot of good questions, a lot of good uh, uh, answers as well. Um, just for sake of uh, people's time and consideration, I do have one quick question. Do we have any new business to bring forward? You do have new business? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do then, sorry, Trish, I'm going to just take a brief recess to let our uh, presenters leave, and then we'll come back to our agenda. <laughs>
But that's very spread out. That's more of a question, I think, for our clerk. If our clerk would be. I guess I would pose the question if the committee's okay with shorter question, a shorter time for presentation and question. I can certainly go back to the groups and see if they're willing to condense their presentations. Um, and then I can open up some more slots. We also do have um, one other day, October 11th, that I could I could try to. Um, Yes, sorry, I, I realize on the, on the sheet it doesn't say that that date is open, but I can definitely work to make those groups um, aware that that date is open and see if that's available. Great. So go? let's just go, you're good? Yeah, I'm going to try to make them work for <laughs> October 11th. <laughs> okay, let's go to Gordon. Um, yeah, uh, October 11th, or I know there's some Fridays that are available. I'd be open to looking at a Friday if that works better for the committee. Um, and it's, it's, it's an open date, so that would be another option. As well, um, UPI has a, a, a section for international students. Um, definitely, sh we don't want to miss out on, on sending them uh, the information. I think they would have a, some, some information there on stats. Can I, can I just interject just for one second, Trish? Would it be okay with the committee if, again, I, I know it is, it's, it's a lot more beneficial when you have presenters in because then you can ask questions when they make a point, everything like that. But again, for the sake of people's time and for the sake of our own committee's time, is it okay to do some of this maybe as a written submission? Like, you know, tell us what your thoughts are on. Um, no, honestly, the, the use, the use pretty much stated that it's, there's a lot of complicated uh, factors in terms of the interaction with mm -hmm. the federal government, um, and there's so much that we haven't dug into at all. I mean, another group that was mentioned, uh, the Atlantic Student Development Alliance, I believe is, is what they're called, um, a group of graduated international students that are, they work to connect students with job opportunities on PEI, so that's another group that would be, you know, certainly very valuable. So I feel like this is a very complex discussion um, that deserves, if we have a whole day, like, I mean, you know, I would be certainly comfortable with uh, spending an afternoon doing this or, or more maybe two maybe you know as much time as we have but. yeah I, 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 like I said I'm not saying that it's not yeah. I'm just saying that like if we're getting Holland College UPEI UPEI Student Union Black Cultural Society BIPOC Usher the Atlantic Student yeah. what was this right Atlantic Student Development Alliance so is my understanding. like that's six if they all do even an hour presentation, if we shorten their presentations, you know what I mean? That's, we're into almost three full days. That, I, I, again, I, what I'm saying though is, is, is this something that we want to tackle fresh, possibly in the new year? And I, I understand that, yes, it's very important, but that, again, that's kind of my, responsibility on schedule. So I'm going to go to our clerk first. Um, I was just going to offer, if I present October 11th as an option and there are some groups who are unable to make it, um, would the committee then be okay with, in lieu of presentation, sending in a written submission for the meantime? To start. To start, yeah. yeah. And then you can decide if that's enough. We can maybe look at some Fridays. Just wait one second, sorry. Uh, then. I would expect that there's a number of organizations that would be passionate to speak on this and would actually really appreciate the opportunity. So I think step one would be reaching out, inviting them, letting them know we have time on the 11th, and if they weren't able to, that we would still accept a written submission if they would like. Does that mm -hmm. seem reasonable, folks? Core? And I would think that we can, maybe we can, if we're looking at the day, we can divide it up into maybe the first section being community groups, second section being administration for Holland College UPI, third section being students or student representatives in the student union. I like that. Yeah, that sounds good. Now, my question to the group is before, if we go ahead with that, I would like to have some limit on question, question time. Do you know what I mean? Just because, again, for if we're trying to schedule, and this is more for our clerk as well, if you're trying to schedule three groups to come in and you say, okay, Lynn and Trish, I'm, you guys are going to be presenting at 2 o'clock, Gord, you're at 3, and Zach, you're at 4, and then Lynn and Trish go till 3, Gord goes till 4.30, and then the committee's like, okay, Zach, you can present for 20 minutes with questions for 5 minutes, you know what I mean? So uh, that's just my, my, my take on it as chair. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. And I'm going to go to Trish first. So 
First, let me just say, as someone who is uh, very dependent on my calendar and yeah. keeping things on time, I, I can appreciate the concern here. I do want to note, though, that it's really hard to establish in advance, you know, a number of questions because we don't know what topics are going to come up, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, we have, uh, like, when the department comes in, you know, if they're bringing uh, new information that, you know, is, is new and there's new questions to ask, I really don't think we can, it's fair to outline that in advance. Um, so perhaps allowing um, or providing information to the presenters to let them know that this is the guideline of time, um, uh, uh, but there it may go over, just be prepared for that. Um, I think is is certainly a reasonable thing to let them know, but I'm really not comfortable with limiting questions in advance. Sometimes you get you ask a question, and that leads to another question. And mm -hmm. I would hate to shut down those opportunities when you know we've brought someone uh, presenters all the way in here, um, and which, uh, we miss out on. Which is why I'm saying that I don't want it to. And again, that's just my take. I think you and I differ on this, Trish. Um, okay. You know, ultimately, I'm going to go to Gord first, and then Lynn. I'll just commit to watching my preambles for you, Chair, and <laughs> the rest is up to you. You set the rules in this committee. This is, you're the chair, and well, I, no, will no, no, follow, it's I will follow the rules, so that's all I have to say. Two but. questions in one. <laughs> Lynn? That is, we don't have to have a fixed end date with committees. There is no obligation for us to wrap up at 4 o'clock. So we don't actually run the risk that the last presenter only gets five minutes because we don't have to leave unless uh, there's another committee scheduled after. I, I don't disagree with you, but I'm j I just keep in mind of staff or also what Trish and what you had mentioned as well about living on your calendar. Like if my young fellow is going to a soccer practice at five o'clock or if our presenters person has a dance class at five o'clock and they're under the expectation that they're coming in at, you know, say th they're presenting at three and then that present presentation gets bumped till 4.30. You know, that, that's my only take on it. And it's just opening up for discussion. That's all it is. The only other thing I would add. Sorry, Lynn, go ahead. If you do need to leave at one point, as the chair, you absolutely can, and someone else can fill in for you in oh, that yeah. moment, yeah, as I'm long as we have someone else, because I wouldn't want you to feel like you couldn't make your commitments. Yeah, I'm aware of it. I appreciate that. Okay, so going forward, we're going to aim for the 11th with which groups are we asking? <laughs> See who's available. You know, I really like uh, Gord's idea of sure. grouping the presenters. If, if everybody comes back and says yes, first of all, if everybody comes back and says yes, we really want to talk about this, thanks for inviting us, uh, great. Mm -hmm. And we should be accommodating that, uh, you know, to the uh, best that we can. So, yeah, invite. I think everybody that was, uh, all the groups that we listed there would be important. So let's invite them and see who can come on the 11th and go from there. So I'm going to go with, I forget whose idea it was, but saying the 11th is open. If you cannot present that day, uh, to feel free to offer a written submission. Yes, perfect. Okay, and do you want to, do you know what I will get, if it's okay with you, is mm -hmm. to maybe draft up some kind of uh, a letter that would be sent to these groups, and then we can uh, send that to the committee members. Sure. Sound good? Um, can I just, on the topic of um, written submission, um, the PEI Teachers Federation are unable to make the date on the 27th and they want a few weeks of school being in session to be able to bring back um, some accurate information just on the learning outcomes there. Um, and so they were wondering if they could send a written submission in the meantime and maybe appear at a later date. So that's about starting? Yeah. Sure. Starting. Yeah. 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 Um, and then also the UPEI wrote back and just wanted a little bit more direction on the topic of learning outcomes. So whether that's on the academic side of things or more operational and logistics. Up to y'all. What's your thoughts? Or do we want to just uh, ask them on both? Leave it up to them. where there might be challenges in, in which of those areas or both. Uh, I mean, it is certainly, I'm sure it's probably very dependent on different departments within UPEI and different, so, you know, yeah, whatever, you know, it's up to that. It, it's up to them to decide what priorities they would like to share with the committee on this topic. And we look forward to the discussion. Okay. And committee's good with that? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, that's it. Gordon? Academic, I know that there, there's, there might be some struggles going on within 
UPI faculty a little bit here with their contract negotiations. So, so I'm looking at saying, hey, let's focus on a little bit more the academic and seeing what they're going to see. But I don't know how to be more clear about that. Okay. You're good? Mm -hmm. Everyone's good? Any other new business? Yeah, perfect. I'll ask for a motion for adjournment. Trish Altes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in.